Uh, it is 7.03. We're going to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, We're going to start with public commentary today. Just a note that usually we do have presentations beforehand. We do have a, a presenter who is coming from one event to another, and that's why our presentation is after a public commentary. Uh, so those of you who have not spoken before, you will have three minutes, up to three minutes. If you um, get close to that, Mrs. Levin will be timing, and she will let you know if there is uh, uh, if you're getting close, she'll try to give you like 30 seconds, et cetera. Uh, we would ask that we have uh, respectful communication. And if there is a need for somebody to get back to you, we'll try to do so uh, within a few business days. Just depends how many um, follow-up items that we do have. But uh, those of you um, who are speaking, uh, you can come up to the podium when I call your name. And we appreciate your input. Uh, it's not a conversation, just for those of you who are new, um, but again, we will get back to you and we will listen to you while you're up here and we appreciate your comments. Uh, first person we have is Owen Ricks. Hello. Thank you for your time. My name is Owen Ricks. I'm a sophomore at Wall Lake Northern High School. I've been a student at Wall Lake, since, uh, Wall Lake School since kindergarten. I'm here today on behalf of my baseball teammates and coaches to ask that you consider looking into finding the means to upgrade the baseball and softball fields at Wall Lake Northern to turf fields. According to my coaches, we typically use anywhere between five to $10,000 of our fundraising money every two to three years, and it still is about ten dollars to $15,000, too little to get it done right. We spend countless hours before and after practice maintaining the field and mound and have to constantly repair and replace it with clay dirt. The home plate area has tremendous runoff and huge puddles accrue in that area making it quite wet and dangerous. Our baseball fields are easily the worst fields in this area. Installing a turf infield would not only eliminate these issues, it would also cut down on the maintenance costs, mowing, grading, seeding, etc. It would also reduce the amount of canceled games due to rain, making the fields unsafe to play on. Not to mention the time, effort, and materials required to make the field playable after a spring thunderstorm. This would all go away if the fields were turf. It would also allow us to get in more reps at practice. Currently, if it's raining, we cannot get reps on our fields. This would tear up the infield and make it even harder to repair and get ready for games. For example, last season, we didn't practice on our field until after two weeks of games because of rain and the field conditions. Because of this, we had no preparation on a real baseball field before we played conference games. This is a huge disadvantage in a competitive sense to get prepared for the season. This limits our ability to improve as a team while other programs are getting their work in and getting better. We also have to compete with in-season sports just to practice on the football field in late March to mid-April because it has turf. To be clear, we're talking about a turf infield only. The outfield would remain grass. This is typical and would be approximately 8,100 square feet of turf. This is much less than a football field, which is approximately 80,000 square feet. You could turf 10 baseball fields for every football field. It seems that every other school in the immediate area has upgraded their baseball fields. Northville, Novi, Milford, Waterford Kettering, Waterford Mott all have turf fields. Huron Valley School sent out a letter to local businesses, and Zot Auto Group donated $60,000 in exchange for naming rights of both Lakeland and Milford's athletic fields. Maybe something like this could be explored within the Waldate community of businesses. I'd like to ask this board to find the means to upgrade our fields to the standards set by the school districts all around us. I personally would love to see my high school have a beautiful turf baseball field before I graduate in 2026. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks. Larry Gray. Larry Gray. Good evening, uh, Larry Gray, uh, Supervisor for Commerce Township. Uh, item 10 tonight, you guys have on your agenda um, flashing lights for Wall Lake Central. I just wanted to come and let you know that the Township Board of Commerce has supported this with you folks. Uh, this project is going to cost approximately um, 70, 
$73,000. Uh, out of that $73,000, two thirds of that will be paid from our tri-party monies. So your total cost um, for that project will be approximately about $24,000, one third of the cost. So I just wanted to, to let you folks know uh, what that cost would be. Uh, I can stick around if you have questions, but uh, uh, Commerce is here to support you on that. And if there's anything else we can do, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Lippitt. Good evening, Ron Lippitt, Commerce Township. My wife, Denise, are 20-year 20, uh, 20 residents of the community. We have three daughters who have thrived in Wild Lake schools, including our youngest, who is currently a sophomore at Wild Lake Northern. Uh, I stand before you to make two very brief points. First, uh, in regard to public comment itself, uh, a few meetings back, there was a speaker at this very podium who suggested it might do the district a service if commenters were compelled to state where they live, work, or whether they have direct affiliation with the district prior to their statements. I remember thinking at the time that this was a terrific suggestion. After all, contextual data like this would surely help the board and those in attendance to better understand the motivation of those who bring valuable insight uh, to these proceedings and perhaps create some clarity on the views which might come from the outside. To be clear, this is no way meant to be a limit on public comment. Uh, in fact, Michigan's Open Meeting Act is very clear on this, that no person may be excluded from an open meeting except in the case of a breach of peace. Further, any rule which has the effect of denying a citizen the right to public comment is to be seen as invalid. That's a direct quote. Because of this, I feel it's in the public interest for commenters to feel at ease uh, that their voice is indeed welcome here. But should the board accept this suggestion that noting their place of residence and or affiliation to the district uh, before speaking would indeed be valuable. Secondly, uh, we are now officially in the holiday season. Uh, I know this because uh, each day I hear my daughter frantically practicing her violin uh, for the upcoming Wild Lake Northern Collage concert. So I hope to see uh, many of you at this incredible event next week, December 12th and 13th. Uh, sadly, a quick look at the Ludus uh, ticketing system confirms it has, yes, once again sold out. Uh, but as changes always seem to happen, I encourage you to inquire to the possibility of last minute tickets next week. And if this year is just not in the cards for you, perhaps you might consider putting a note in your calendar uh, for next year to experience this extraordinary display of talent, cheer, and humor uh, from our community's youth. This is one of those moments where all in attendance come away with not just the pride of seeing our children excel in the arts, uh, but perhaps encourage a positivity and warmth that uh, might not have, have existed a few hours uh, prior. Uh, there's a reason this is one of the most sought after events of the music calendar, and I would just like to take a moment to congratulate uh, the orchestra, band, and choir at uh, Waldeck Northern, along with the dedicated, passionate staff who make this event possible every single year. It is truly the high point of the holiday calendar for many of us, and I hope you can experience it too in the years to come. Thank you. Robert Gothy. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was hoping last month when I came up here and talked about uh, things like DEI and, and um, critical race theory and all those things, it'd be the last time I had to do so. Um, but about five minutes after I was done, somebody came up here and tried to tell us that uh, equity is all about helping students and you know, helping them with their homework and giving them a little boost. That is not what equity is about. Um, so I'm going to read some things. Uh, this equity is a, a, absolutely a Marxist-Leninist movement aims to create a classless society. In practice, this always means a classless community, communist society where the government owns and runs all productive enterprises, which requires controlling all the people to make sure everyone has equal everything. The Marxist-Leninist idea of equality pivots 180 degrees away from the standards and traditions of equal opportunity and toward a new standard of equal outcome. An outcome is one of DEI's fundamental prin principles. DEI uh, uses words and methods drawn from the Marxist communist vision. It sensitizes and conditions participants toward an inevitable adoption of tenets of a classless society. Notably, DEI's primary focus upon equity, equal outcomes, 
means wholesale rejecting all moral standards of treating people fairly via equal opportunity. Instead, DEI presses for unequal treatment, frankly immoral treatment of people to produce the hazy vision of equal outcomes. Such equity demands that all identity groups, race, gender, etc., share in equal outcomes, irrespective of competency, skill, or individual effort. Now this is a very long article, so I'm just gonna skip to some other things here. Typically, equity is used as a spite club to meet out our ret retribution and get even with those deemed oppressors or victimizers, namely whites, not to unify. DEI as constituted today is a circular paradox, attempts to fight evil, uh, for example, racist ideology, by using the same evil. Reverse racist ideology still produces evil. Evil is evil. Using evil to quench evil only helps spread more evil. Evil can only be out overcome with the opposite force, good. DEI-inspired initiatives can achieve better outcomes by modifying the DEI paradigm and shifting to a more principled DOI. That would be diversity, opportunity, inclusion mindset. 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, designing environments to reflect a commitment to the menageries of flourishing humanity requires a complete rejection of equity and all its modern day collectivist communist baggage and accessories. Likewise, diversity's most significant feature is the inspiring of different viewpoints. Working together from different perspectives promotes harmony when tackling problems or attempting to accomplish forced objectives. The concept of diversity of our strength can become truer where race and identity groups are not the Time. focus. Thank you. Tim Sawmiller. Uh, good evening. Tim Sawmiller, Commerce Township. I'm a cisgender male using pronouns he, him, and his. My remarks tonight are taken mostly from Monticello Magazine. Thomas Jefferson understood that religious freedom, including a strict separation of church and state, was essential for America. With people of many religions coming to America, history taught that any government effort to dictate a proper or acceptable religion was hopeless and dangerous. American religious freedom was established, as Jefferson wrote, for the Jew, the Gentile, the Christian, the Mohammedan, the Hindu, the infidel of every denomination. That would include atheists. Jefferson believed religion was quintessentially a personal decision, the product of one's thoughts and beliefs. Any government intervention interfered with the very essence of intellectual freedom. To direct religious belief was to meddle with the most fundamental freedom of thought, a freedom without which a republic could not survive. Jefferson also believed that for the nation to work and the people, and to, for the nation to work, the people had to be educated. He proposed a three-tiered public education system, what we might think of as elementary, high school, and university. And since genius and ability were spread equally regardless of birth and wealth, it was essential that education be at public expense. And educated citizenry is a public good. When Virginia balked because of the perceived cost, he responded, the tax which will be paid for this purpose is not more than the thousandth part of what will be paid to kings, princes, and nobles who will rise up among us if we leave the people in ignorance. Either the people are educated so that they control the government or aristocracy will control the government and the people. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects, it expects what never was and never will be. While Jefferson believed that public education for the masses was most important, all that was achieved in his lifetime was the founding of the University of Virginia. That, however, is a good reminder. After all, the founders' work on political freedom and religious freedom and personal freedom was incomplete. More needed to be done, expanding voting rights and participation, eliminating laws, restricting rights based on religion, eliminating slavery, and certainly expanding public education. 30 seconds. And the founders knew it. In 1818, he told a Jewish rabbi that although we are free by the law, we are not in practice. As he approached his death, Jefferson wrote that all eyes are opened or are opening to the rights of man. These are the grounds of hope for others. We must continue that work. Thank you. 
I apologize if I mispronounce this. Uh, Abilene uh, Boisbert? Yeah, I'm sure you'll help me and correct me. Hello, my name is Evelyn Boisbert. I go to Walnut Creek Middle School. I'm in eighth grade. Just that calm and collected. It will all be okay, is what I thought as I sat in class trying to gather my head around what had just happened. You're probably confused, so let's rewind a bit to the beginning of the story. It starts in my third hour, math. This class is known to be problematic, and I received the most attention from other students because of my sexuality. The teacher had recently moved our seats. I was sat near the front of the class, near her desk. She sat me near as many accepting people as, she, as possible, but of course, it wasn't perfect. Eventually, our quiz came up. I'm a good student, so I studied, did all my homework, and taken notes. I began to work on the quiz, fully prepared to focus and get it done, when suddenly, my attention was stolen from me. A boy had pulled on my chair. I turned around and looked at him. Of course, he acted like he was innocent. Then, again and again, it conti he continued to do it. One, two, Three, four, five, six. I tensed up, not sure what to do. Seven, eight, nine. I couldn't think. 10, 11, 12. Just get through this one little bit. 13, 14, 15. And finally done. I stood up, stood up and walked silently to the bin to turn in my paper. While facing away, I heard a loud bang. I thought, it's probably just someone dropping something, whatever. And then I finally turned around. Horror-filled tears built in my eyes. Red, right embarrassment painted my cheeks. My fists clenched with frustration and sadness. He had flipped my chair all the way over. The whole class looked at the chair, then at me, then back at the chair. The room burst with laughter until the teacher yelled at us to be quiet. I found counting calming for me, so the rest of the class I counted to myself. When I got out of class, I went to the teacher. I explained the situation and she had to move the kid. This was disappointing though, because he was not given a reason to be moved. He had not been told what he did wrong or how other people could feel because of it. This is not the first time something like this has happened. I have had headphones ripped from my ears, a boy reach into my pants pocket without permission, been tripped in halls and had lockers slammed shut in front of me. But it's not just physical. I have also been called a furry, slut, faggot, and many other slurs and inappropriate names. I have been told to kill myself and have had inappropriate comments made about my body. The LGBTQ community is a minority in the school district. Because of this, peers tend to discriminate and harass seconds. us. And because, and if you ask if I've reported it, I have tried. Many teachers turn a blind eye and say that they will do something, but the next day things, no, things show no sign of change or improvement. This isn't fair. Please put some thought into how to solve this problem. I have been for months now, and I hope you will too. If we work together, we all can change. Thank you. Nancy Van Leeuwen. I would like to take a minute to talk about two points of pride. Um, one, today in, on a LEA activity, I had the opportunity to go to Wald Lake Elementary. And while I was there, had the opportunity to go into a social worker's room. A room, a real room, with windows, whiteboard, desk, table, a real room. My growing up in Wald Lake as a teacher had the social worker in a custodian's closet, in a supply room, in a dark room without windows. So thank you very much for our people who push these things forward, who encourage bond issues to relieve situations like this, which is what happened at Wild Lake Elementary. The former offices became her social work room and new offices were arranged in the building. And that's all because of our supportive community who approve bond issues and support our schools. Point, that's my first point of pride. My second was the opportunity to go see the Wizard of Oz last weekend, a remarkable performance which only reminds all of us that the performing arts are a priority in our district and have been for years and years and years. Our boards of education over all of those years even when times were tough, even when money was at 
at a premium. The performing arts and the visual arts have always been supported. And if you look at places like the Insider, you see of our student accolades for those who have gone on to Broadway, who have gone on to other um, facilities and in, are performing in orchestras and bands and so forth and so on. So thank you again, Wald Lake, for supporting the performing arts and the visual arts. Thank you for supporting the bond issues. Desiree Dragon. I'm uh, Desiree Dragon, parent of uh, three Wald Lake students. Um, my concern today is about a resource room teacher who <coughs> is amazing and has been spread thin. Um, she has to drive to two different schools every day. Um, for half of the hour in math, she has to leave for half of the hour so that other half hour, the math teacher is left without support and the students are left without support. Um, she's burnt out and it's sad and frustrating to see her like this because it, it causes inconsistency for the students and for the teacher. And I'm just hoping that you guys consider assigning teachers to a single school rather than multiple schools because having teachers run around town creates teacher burnout and inconsistency, inconsistency for students and teachers who require the extra support. Um, you know, we all know that they deserve more than what they're getting. So if we could make a consideration and get extra support or some type of solution, I'll, I'll be happy and so will she. Thank you. Thank you. Salvana Pata. Good evening. I stand before you today as a concerned parent joined by over 200 signatures um, on this petition to address an issue that affects our community. I am here to discuss the current state of the special education classes in our district, particularly the autism program at Walnut Creek Middle School. Many of you may not be aware that the special needs classes at Walnut Creek do not follow the school, uh, the school feed pattern into high school. This discrepancy is a disservice to both special needs students and their families. <clears throat> By separating special needs students from their friends and familiar faces, we hinder their ability to form important connections and impede their social development within the school community. Furthermore, the separation of uh, special needs students from their typical siblings attending the same school places an unnecessary strain on families and disrupts the family dynamic. <clears throat> we believe that by aligning the special needs program at Walnut Creek with the high school pattern, we can alleviate the concerns and create more inclusive and supportive school environment for all. Currently, the autism program at Walnut Creek consists of three classrooms, with a fourth classroom pending the hiring of a special education teacher. However, unlike 90% of Creek students who move on to Central High School, the autism program directs students to Northern High School. The stark contrast in the school feed pattern creates a sense of exclusion and inequality for special needs students in our district. It is essential to emphasize that this is not about one school being better than the other. <clears throat> We acknowledge the excellence of the Northern High School program and appreciate the hard work and dedication of the teachers and the staff. However, it cannot be denied that from my own two children and many others, leaving behind their friends they had worked so hard to build a relationship with was undeniably difficult. Furthermore, it's important to mention that the existing autism program at Walnut Creek uh, caters to 23 students spread across three classrooms where the program at Northern High School currently serves 15 students in two classrooms. This indicates that the autism program will need to be expanded by adding more classes in the near future, regardless of the feeding pattern. 
In conclusion, I would like to reiterate the importance of addressing this issue and urge the Wild Lake School Board to take immediate action by aligning the school education program at Walnut Creek with the high school pattern. 30 seconds. We can create a more inclusive, supportive, and enriching educational experience for all students. Together, let us ensure that every child in our district has equal opportunities to thrive academically, socially, and emotionally. Thank you. Thank you. Mara Frond. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mara Freund, and I am a parent of a young adult student of the Adult Transition Program, also known as ATP. So I'm here today to voice some concerns that we, um, are, uh, we are talking and trying to fix and that affect directly to our program. But first of all, um, I wanna thank Dr. Bernia for taking the time to meet with a small group of parents um, and discuss and listen to our concerns. So number one, after great anticipation for the new wing being built at Wall Lake Western High School, just recently we learned that ATP is not contemplated as any part of that, even though parents, staff, members of the program and the community in general heard otherwise from different sources. Number two, as today there is a long list of very basic and much needed repairs and renovations in the classrooms and in the bathrooms of the program that need immediate attention. This being um, brought to the attention of um, the school district, so we would greatly appreciate um, some action on that. Number three, as today we know there is a possibility of the ATP being relocated. So we are asking, asking you to analyze the most appropriate alternatives, keeping in mind the goal of uh, arriving at the best possible outcome for our students. Our special needs students deserve equal consideration and honest and clear communication with regards of decisions that affect them today and in their future. Our students have great potential. We just need to provide them with the tools to reach that full potential. They can be very, very productive and happy members of our society. I invite today everybody in this room to give them the chance. And also, and lastly, I just want to thank and um, tell them that as a parent, I'm very, I'm very uh, grateful for the uh, staff we have at the ATP, that they work tirelessly every single day with our young adults, and they are helping them every single day to become the best version of themselves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle Burnett. Good evening, my name is Michelle Burnett and I am a parent of a student in the Adult Transition Program and also a parent to um, a Waldeg Northern Highest Honors graduate that went on to play collegiate athletics and graduate from college with high honors. Those two paths are very different and what we have experienced in Waldeg is no different. One path was met with ease, guidance, great facilities and great resources while the other one seemed to always be ch a challenge advocating for a voice, a seat at the table, just trying to be included and to be part of the every child, every day motto. We've struggled there. And once again, we're here needing to advocate for our students. We, the ATP students, staff and families, reached out previously in an email about our concerns regarding the program. A group of us have met with Dr. Bernia and we believe he hears us and we are working together to determine next steps for our program. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. We all appreciate that very much. But our purpose today is to address the board. We wanna make sure that what happened to this program over the past year or multiple years doesn't happen again. The plan, or led to believe plan, 
was that, our mo that our moving our students into Wald Lake Western, they would be picked up in the 2019 bond and rebuild of Wald Lake Western to have a state-of-the-art facility to match its state-of-the-art, highly recognized program. We were led to believe that our students would be moving into an updated facility. Members of the community and the ATP team had been led to, led to believe that the program was getting its own designated space in the new Wald Lake Western. In October of 2023, in a last minute meeting, we were informed that the program was no longer part of the bond. Fast forward a few weeks, we were then told we were not part of the bond. We were informed the district had spent five million on our, um, our students moving into this new, new home. The board is now listening to a facility utilization review and proposals to make changes and cut costs to the district. An option on the table is moving our ATP students again. And our students don't do well with change. And the board even mentioned that in the last meeting. While we learned that the district spent a lot of money for a temporary move, we are here to make sure that doesn't happen again. We aren't sure where the disconnect happened, but the next move should be the right move. Because of the mixed messages and lack of transparency, we feel like we've been left and not included, and our students deserve better. We are here asking the board to keep us in mind as you review facility changes and bonds. We believe increased transparency and oversight is essential to ensure our students don't get left behind again. As an elected board of this, this district, we do expect oversight and transparency, and that's especially true as you may come back to the taxpayers for another bond. Every child, every day, that should include our transition program students. The ATP program is growing while the facility study shows overall declining enrollment. With ATP increasing enrollment, improved facilities should be at the top of the list to keep our districts here. The district prides itself on being inclusive. Let's follow that in everything we do. Time. And we do appreciate all our hardworking ATP teachers and staff for all they do. And thanks again for your time and Dr. Bernia for working with us to make this right for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Hensley. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Board of Education, cabinet members as well. My name is Corey Hensley. I currently serve as president of the Special Services Parent Advisory Committee, PAC, here in Wald Lake. I'm here tonight in support, in support of staff and parents of the Adult Transitions Program, also known, better known as ATP. Parents first contacted me in September for help, specifically to address construction at Wild Lake Western, as well as the lack of communication, transparency, and facility needs as it relates to the ATP program. I asked questions, met with families, and decided that this group needed my help to right a wrong. I appreciate the swift response from President Casagrande regarding the questions, but more importantly, the purpose of the email was to bring this matter to the board's attention. You, as a board, are tasked with many responsibilities, including oversight, safety, and the welfare of all of our students, every child, every day. Staff and parents felt betrayed as they were led to believe that the 2019 bond included the ATP program and that they would receive a new state-of-the-art facility. Plans were developed and staff collaborated with architects to gather ideas for the program space while ensuring accommodations were being met for student needs. All the work was for naught as staff learned that within the last year that ATP was never part of the bond and that there would be no state-of-the-art facility. Many things just don't add up in parents' minds, and we must do better for adults in the program. While we cannot change what's already been decided, we can, can now and are paying attention. We are asking that you as a board also pay attention to the developments of the ATP program. We have witnessed, you have witnessed state-of-the-art ES, ECSE buildings being built, uh, the ESCE building being built, schools and classrooms being remodeled, and I currently see athletic team buildings going up to three high schools. Don't you think ATP program deserves the very best too? As we hear outcomes from the final utilization study this evening with recommendations from Plant Moran, blah, Plant Moran, we ask that you keep the ATP program at the forefront of your mind. Whether the program stays at Wild Lake Western or moves to a new location, we ask for your support to right a wrong and ensure that the ATP program is a state-of-the-art program drawing families into Wild Lake. I want to personally thank Dr. Bernia for listening to ATP parent concerns and we look forward to working with you to right that wrong. Board members, can we ask you for your support too? Thank you. Thank you. Robin Shapiro. Hello, my name is Robin Shapiro. I'm a teacher for students with autism spectrum disorder at Oakley Park. 
This is my 19th year um, teaching in Wild Lake, and I'm here tonight to share and highlight some of the amazing things that are happening at Oakley Park. Just to go through some of the neat programs we have, um, we participate in a program called Owl Nest, which is a monthly 30-minute session of multi-age team building activities. Each nest consists of kindergarten through fifth graders with an assigned teacher or staff member who help grow and build connections throughout their time at Oakley Park. We host a Girls on the Run and Strive Club, which is a club that teaches life skills through dynamic interactive lessons and running games and culminates with all the kids participating in a 5K run. We are currently holding our PTA annual book fair. Also, um, our PTA annual raffle raised um, our goal and Mrs. Froning took eight pies in the face um, for the students who earned um, and sold the most money to support our school. We're very fortunate to have Oakley, our therapy dog, and he is here tonight. He's very busy visiting classrooms um, on a schedule and to support our SEL learning. We are also recognized as a green school. We have a student council. We have a school news team. So every morning, our announcements come from the kids over um, a broadcast. Um, we are adopting a family in need from the GSRP Head Start Preschool to bring some holiday cheer and support um, to those families in needs. Our school also has a watchdogs program, which helps students be positively impacted by involvement of father and father-like figures in their student's life. We hold grade level music concerts. Last night was the fifth grade concert performance. It was wonderful. Um, we also part participate with our parents in a lunchbox crew, which provides an opportunity for parents and special friends to volunteer and lend support to our st students during recess and lunch. We have a SNAPS program, which stands for Students Need a Pal. It is a peer-to-peer -peer support system for students with autism, and it currently involves our fourth and fifth grade students. Our ASD program also runs a beverage cart. This um, cart um, is twice a month, and it helps the students practice life skills that include following a recipe, sequencing steps and activity, fulfilling an order, social skills, sharing, peer-to-peer -peer work, basic number recognition, reading, comprehension, health and hygiene, and so much more. 30 and seconds. our first graders have been reading different versions of the gingerbread man. Parents are invited to a gingerbread program where students will share different versions of the story and read poems. And they'll also share their very own version of the gingerbread man that they've been working on and writing. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak this evening and share how the PTA, our support staff, and teachers work together to make OPE a caring community. Thank you. I'm going to move on to administrative commentary. Dr. Bernia. We're going to begin tonight to my right with Mr. Durkin. Nothing, nothing this evening, Dr. Bernia. Mrs. Kohansky. Thank you. I have nothing tonight. Ms. Muir. Nothing tonight, Dr. Bernia. Mr. Chatfield. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bernia. I just wanted to report that uh, last week we completed our annually required uh, Michigan State Police bus inspections. Uh, we ran 109 buses through the uh, comprehensive inspection program. 106 of those got uh, received green tags for a perfect um, inspection with two yellow tags and one red tag that were repaired uh, right away. So uh, uh, just so you know, a red tag uh, has to be repaired before that bus can be put back on the road, but a yellow tag, uh, you have 30 days to make that repair. So based on the inspection and based on the maintenance that the, uh, the, the Dean Transportation Mechanics uh, perform on our fleet, they've received a 99.1% pass rating uh, on the maintenance of our fleet. Uh, so I just wanted to congratulate uh, Chris Franklin and uh, Mike, Josh, Darren, and Ryan, uh, the mechanics who do, do a great job of maintaining our fleet. Okay. All right, I'd like to officially welcome Ms. Zomer to the table. Thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for providing such a warm Wild Lake welcome from the staff to the cabinet to my team and obviously I've also met people from the public during our, several of our outings. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and anxious to get hit the ground running. So thank you. Uh, for me this evening, I, I want to, I don't want to steal anything from board members. So I just want to say number one, <laughs> Uh, thank you to Leah for letting me tag along today. It was a lot of fun, but I'm sure Ms. Kaplan will take it from there. Uh, just last week, 
Uh, Mrs. Levin and I had the opportunity to meet with some Girl Scouts from Loon Lake. I'm thinking she's probably going to take that up. So I'm just going to say that it was very nice to meet them, and they were a very impressive group of young ladies and were exactly what we hope our students uh, turn out to be. So I'm very, very grateful to them. I want to thank some of our community partners. You may have seen uh, through our media feed that yesterday we took a number of staff members uh, around, the, around the community to some of our community partners like Hospitality House, uh, Words of Hope, uh, Words for Hope, and the Detroit Institute for Children. I want to thank those community partners for hosting us, but I also want to thank our staff for coming along. I really appreciate that. And then we're constantly, one of the things when I came to the district we were hearing a lot about was the, the collaboration between general education staff and special education staff. Uh, to that end, I brought forth a proposal to add a cabinet member, and I've been so pleased with how Mrs. Kahansky and Ms. Muir have been working together, but I really saw it in action. I was invited to Loon Lake Elementary earlier this week, where before school, on their own time, the general education and special education staff come together and they meet and they talk about the issues of the day and have a very practical discussion on how they can work together better. And that is what world-class school districts do. And so I just want to compliment those staff members. I want to thank them for the invitation because it, uh, it was enjoyable to, to see them do their work. And, and I also want to compliment them on taking that initiative. And last but not least, it is the holiday season. I know Hanukkah begins today. And so I want to wish everybody just the, the very best of everything with, uh, with your family and, and at this time of year. Thank you. Thank you. With board commentary, we're going to start with Mrs. Fernandez. Anything tonight? Yeah, I wanted to uh, just let folks know that uh, as a board, we had an opportunity to come together and do some training together. I won't say more about that in case Mrs. Casagrande or somebody else <laughs> is planning on doing that, but um, that course was one course in a series of several that um, comprise a uh, data analytics certificate um, from the MASB organization. And so with that course together with my peers and then the ones that I've done in self-study, um, that certification is under the belt. And um, so I'm trying to feel a little bit smarter every time I do something like that. Thank you, Mr. Siegler. Anything tonight? Well, you know, we are in the holiday season and uh, festivities and we're all feeling great. And, you know, I had the opportunity of going to Western for Wizard of Oz. And when you look again at the talent of our students throughout the district in all areas it is it just is heartwarming and it puts a great big smile on your face and i know we have fools coming up at Walnut Lake central uh, this upcoming weekend and i also had the opportunity of attending the thanksgiving lunch that we had at the conservation center and you know it's it's amazing what we as a community can do when we really want to and what we can achieve. And it's nice to see that we are getting back in that manner because for a while we weren't. And I really do appreciate seeing what's going on. So thank you and happy holidays. Anything tonight, Ms. Tice? <laughs> I don't have much of a voice. Um, no, I was just gonna a little bit echo what Mr. Siegler had said. Um, there's a lot, a lot of talent in our district here and I know somebody already um, you know, mentioned the collage concert coming up. And last year, um, I got to attend for the first time, um, and it was quite impressive. Um, so I just um, encourage you guys, to, if you're able, um, it's a great uh, just holiday event to attend, um, but also all the plays um, put on by the district, um, they're, they're just all quite impressive. So I encourage you to attend if you're able. Mr. Peterson, anything tonight? A few comments. Um, it was brought to my attention uh, about a week ago that there was a new, a new uh, uh, directive or statement that was put out by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Education, which basically is a uh, policy statement on inclusion of children with disabilities in early childhood programs. Uh, it's about a 71-page document. Uh, I have gone from back to front. Uh, it's very uh, impressive, to be honest with you. Um, I found it was well written. It's uh, not. Um, it's more collaborative than I've seen in many, many documents. Uh, 
It defines uh, several areas that not only for early child development, the importance of including our special uh, needs and disability uh, children, but it, I think at the same time when you read it, you'll find that it, uh, it really transcends all programs in, in, in the uh, a sense of inclusionary practices. So I uh, will urge Dr. Bernia to please post it uh, so that you all have a chance to review it. Uh, I would uh, strongly recommend it, um, that you read it. Uh, at the same time that I was passing this to Dr. Bernia, he passed us a uh, similar document, in this case on the impacts of congressional underfunding of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the educational system. This was actually produced by the uh, K-12 Alliance and uh, on behalf of Haley Stevens, a uh, local congress congressman, as we uh, may all know. Again, it's a, a formidable document. It makes us aware of where the deficiencies are, where the, the funding deficiencies are for disability programs, um, district by district. Uh, it's very localized uh, in, in many ways, uh, again, uh, ask Dr. Bernier to please post it so that you all have a chance to, and opportunity to read it. I think you'll find it very informative. Um, I was fortunate enough a couple weeks ago, right before Chris, uh, Christmas, right before Thanksgiving, to attend the Thanksgiving feast that was uh, is put on by Multi Lakes. There were several of us that did uh, attend that meeting or attend that uh, uh, event. And it's for our special needs kids and I've done it for several years now, and it's just a really great time uh, for me, not having the opportunity to see some of these kids anymore since, of, since retirement days in June. Um, it was great to see a lot of them that I have had at various times in their educational process there, so very good. And the last but not least, last night I did the uh, community forum on mental health and security uh, funding and programs. Uh, Dr. Lance uh, chaired that did, I think, a very formidable job in uh, explaining to people that were there some of the pitfalls and challenges and all those other de decisions. And even I, as a board member coming out of there, came out with a few new uh, points that I was not aware of. So these community forums are powerful. Um, a lot of times there's only a handful of us there. You get a chance to really uh, engage. Um, where you may not have that opportunity or kind of writing an email is not so easy to get a formidable response. So I encourage that uh, immensely. So that's it for me. Anything tonight, Mrs. Levin? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Cascarande. Um, as Dr. Bernia mentioned, happy Hanukkah to everybody celebrating the first night of Hanukkah tonight. Um, everything uh, you know that I've been up to the last couple weeks has been covered, so I won't uh, bore you with things like our workshop and the uh, Michigan Association of School Boards data certification that I've been working on and the Girl Scout event. Um, but what's really been awesome to see is um, the various student activities and community activities that are happening at all of the schools, um, like the adoptive families, the giving trees, all of the food collections, like the thousands and thousands of pounds of cans that have been delivered. So, um, you know, so that's really been great. And it's, it's always great to see the community come together. Um, in my day job, I was able to participate in a Shop with a Cop program uh, earlier this week where there were students from our own district involved. And so, it, you know, it's this time of year that kind of brings everybody together. Um, you know, we, we've all got our, our differences. We all have different traditions, but we all celebrate things. And so, um, it's, it's great to, to kind of hear about those things, see those things, and, and really participate in those things. So um, I do hope everybody has a, a great holiday season and a very happy new year. Anything tonight, Mrs. Kaplan? Yes, thank you. Um, I did want to echo that Fools is this weekend, so please come see that. Uh, Mr. Lippitt talked about Northern's collage concert. Central has a collage concert scheduled, and so does Western. You know, pick one. They're fantastic. They bring such holiday spirit and cheer to everybody who gets to see one. So please, come out to one of those. I wanna say congratulations to the Wald Lake Marching Band on placing third at Nationals a few weeks ago. And that was the first time in an immensely amount of time that we come that close to a national um, win. And that's a fantastic. The bands travel to Indiana and they compete against all over the country bands. And so that's a fantastic thing, and congratulations to them. 
Then I'm going to switch my hat a little bit, and I'm going to talk about some of the things from Leah and say thank you, Dr. Bernia, for helping us today as we um, proceeded over to Wild Lake um, Elementary with what we called boredom busters. Um, we met with the fourth and fifth graders, and we passed out boredom buster bags. Um, say that a few times. And they include things for them to do over break, you know, such as making muffins or popcorn, some arts and crafts activities. And it was a fantastic. The, the kids were super excited. It was a fantastic day for everyone involved. Um, so I want to thank the Wild Lake um, L staff that attended and helped us, and our LEA staff that helped with that. <coughs> On Monday, LEA has our first shop with a hero because we include firefighters, police officers, and EMS. We'll be at our uh, Commerce Myers. Um, it's a fantastic thing. We have 26, I think it is, um, students in our district that come and shop, and Myers, so thank you, Myers, contributes financially to give them gift cards to be able to shop, and then each family will get a basket of groceries as they exit. So it's a fantastic event there. And we also have one on the 12th, over at Wicks and Myers, with I think that one's just shop with a cop, um, and again, that's with our students, and it's a fantastic event, and we appreciate that Myers for helping our community. And then on the 13th, we have Adopt a Child, which the community in Wild Lake and all over has adopted numerous children in our district. Um, I can't recall the number, but I'm thinking 86 plus is where we are at. Am I right? Yeah, 86. Um, here on Valley Hospital is a big supporter of us, and they adopt a bunch of our students and our children, and they package things up, and it is an entire day. I think we start over at Huron Valley at 8 a.m. and load trucks to bring the packages back here, and then we set them all up, and then the families will come and pick them up throughout the day. And the LEA staff works tirelessly to pass out these um, gifts to the families. So. Thank you to all of our community members that help us with all of those things, and thank you all for all your support for Leia. And have a very happy and peaceful holiday season. <laughs> so I just want to say to us, we made it through the first year. This is our 12th regular meeting, right? We've had extra meetings, but we've made it through the first year. And I just want to comment that you know we, we have study sessions, we have closed sessions, et cetera. And today, I was really noticing a lot of kind of, you know, jabbing and joking. And it was just really nice to see that. So you may not see that at this board table because we're here for our regular meeting and it's, you know, serious work that we're doing here. But uh, for whatever that's worth, my perspective, it's really um, nice to see the board jollying and getting to know each other. Um, whenever you bring in new members, and significantly, you know, three is, is, is big with a board of seven. It's, it's really nice that over the last year we've been able to, uh, to get some good work done. Um, as Mrs. Fernandez talked about, we did have a session on district strategic uh, planning and goal setting, and we are committed to start working on a strategic plan together. So Dr. Bernie is going to help us with that. Um, we have had strategic plans in the past, and I think that will give us as a board some very good focus and some good work to do. That will also involve, you know, community members along the way as well as we start looking at this. And it pairs very nicely with the work that we're going to be doing with the facility study. So just um, thank you, Mrs. Fernandez, for priming the pump on that. I appreciate that. I also, um, we've gone in a few sessions with uh, Dr. Bernia and uh, had conversations about how he's doing with us. He hit the year mark, which uh, we talked about at, I think, our last meeting or so. And we continue to have conversations about our you know, goals and, and how he is doing and what he wants to work on. And it's a long list. So um, I just um, want to thank you on behalf of the board for all the work you're doing, continue to do. And it's uh, really nice to hear in public commentary the the thank yous to then the collaboration so we don't always get that um, and that's okay but when we do we really appreciate that so thank you and and last um, I will echo the the fine arts and how many times have you seen Wizard of Oz but when I went to Wizard of Oz there's just there's something new and I had gone to a, a performance in Royal Oak and it was good but it had nothing on our um, performers here it was just amazing it really was and in Toto and the Scarecrow and a few others just stole the show they were just amazing 
Um, the Yes, Fools, and we will be going to that, and the Collage Concert. Unfortunately, I can't hit the Northern one because Fools is this weekend and it's really hard, but, uh, but we'll get there. And I have two, two sons who um, were in the orchestra, and it's really just amazing to see the orchestra and the band and the uh, choir. And personally, I don't know what they're going to do this year, but when they do the Hallelujah Chorus, um, it's just amazing. I don't know if they'll do that or not, but they've done that before, and it's just phenomenal. So now on to the rest of the business. Um, so we're going to move on to our consent agenda. On our consent agenda tonight, we have an approval of minutes. Both uh, meeting minutes are from November 2nd. We had a special meeting and a closed session, and then we also had a regular meeting. We have personnel recommendations, new hires and retirements. We also have disbursements in the amount of $18,762,029. And we have purchases under $50,000 for uh, the K through 8 Safari Montage Software and License Renewal through November 2024. That is for $43,326.75 from our general fund. And we also have a Head Start Director's Report. Ms. Slevin. I move that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And next we have our Strategic Facility Planning Committee final report. Dr. Bernia. I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Chatfield. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. A district-wide committee of stakeholders representing all schools in many departments uh, has been meeting to review data from the facility utilization study completed by Plant Moran Real Point last spring in an effort to assess the study's findings and develop considerations to utilize our facilities in a more efficient and cost-effective manner. Paul Wills from Plant Moran Real Point, who has assisted in facilitating this process, uh, will provide a final report highlighting the committee's work. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chaffield. Uh, Dr. Bernie, and good evening, board members. We're going to get the format here uh, one second. Very good, and good evening. Um, yes, as Mr. Chatfield uh, mentioned, this is the uh, final presentation from the committee's work. And first and foremost, I do want to thank those uh, 55 plus committee members, uh, Dr. Bernia, Mr. Chatfield, and some others from central office administration teams to really come together with what we consider recommendations for board considerations. So again, this is the findings um, through surveys, through a lot of data mining uh, accordingly going forward. So. Tonight's presentation, uh, we thought it'd be helpful just to give it an update on enrollment. So the October uh, fall count, I know it's maybe not officially, uh, but we do have the unaudited official counts that kind of gives you a breakdown by school, also by grade level. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the cohorting. So again, your current K5, 6, 8, 9, 12s, potentially a K4, a 5, 8, or 9, 12 model. Um, talk a little bit about capital timing. So again, um, I think some of the things you heard tonight is how do you continue to improve on your district's facilities, and we'll talk a little bit about that, as well as timing. So again, um, previously the board took about a year, year and a half to implement some of these changes. It gives the district really time to really focus on the academics. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Also the financials, uh, the operations, transportation, food service, etc. And then in, in section four, we do actually have the survey results uh, for the board's purview tonight. And then of course we'll open up for questions and answers as we go through it. Uh, so, uh, update fall enrollment. Uh, so again, right now you currently have 12 elementary schools. Uh, if you take a look at the K-5, um, there's about 5,425 students. If you recall from the previous presentations, the district has a capacity for roughly 6,500 students. Uh, that 4,525 does include special education uh, as well as general population education accordingly. You can also see the special ed uh, over at Twin Sun as well as the Early Childhood Special Education Center. So this kind of gives you a synopsis, not only by building on the left-hand side, but also by grades. And so one of the things you're gonna to start to notice in these slides is your current graduating class is over 1,000. Going forward, you have no other classes that are, are near that 1,000 mark. You're gonna start seeing 950, 925. You're seeing 888, 876. So um, as we mentioned, the birth rate is down in Oakland County. Um, people really like to live in the Walled Lake District area, so their kids have graduated, the parents stay there, and the, and the guardians stay there. So it's, again, you're not seeing a lot of uh, 
uh, I'll call it um, growth, but again, it, the decline is starting to, starting to uh, slow down, if you will, at the K-5 level. Those buildings that you see in red, so again, when you look at kind of your peer groups, um, elementary schools traditionally have um, somewhere in the 4, 450, 500 range. So again, these are uh, just kind of where you're at holistically. If you go back to 2006, you actually had roughly about 64, 6,500 students in the 12 configuration going forward. I also want to point out the 972 in kindergarten grades. Um, there's 122 junior kindergartners. So again, there's really 850 at the K level, and then obviously those would repeat accordingly. So that's kind of that new normal that we talked about of the 850, 875. Moving on to the middle school and high school levels. So you currently have four middle schools that are grades six through eight. Uh, about 2,700 students in there. Again, going back to 2006, 2008, you had just over 5,000 students. And then same thing with the three high schools. And again, you kind of see by grade levels. So as I mentioned, the current uh, 12th grade year, you have just over 1,000. Again, 895, 935, 887, et cetera, going forward. So um, as a district, your preliminary uh, fall counts just uh, over 12,000. Uh, it's at 12,138. So what does this mean? So obviously you have challenges with decreased enrollment. You look at the funding sources from the state of Michigan per pupil, and again, that's oftentimes the challenge of districts is how do you run more efficiently with the dollars you're given for the students that you have? We're gonna transition a little bit to the cohorts. Uh, so again, this is your current 12 elementary schools in the first column of colors. Um, the middle column is actually your middle schools, and then at your high schools, you've got your your uh, three high schools there. So as you can see, not every elementary goes directly um, from middle school until high school. So there's are, there are some splits, if you will, uh, especially at the western, central, and, and northern. So again, this may be an opportunity for the board to really look at that cohort and how do we potentially align our elementary programming to our middle school programming into a high school. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Lastly is also the mapping. Um, so one of the things that we've looked hard at as a committee is what if we have a K-4 elementary school, maybe a 5-6, then a 7-8, a 9-12? There's a lot of conversations and concern about multiple transitions. So if I have a fifth grader, I have to run across town to get my seventh grader, potentially to a high school. Um, so again, that 5-6 to a 7-8 um, was just too many transitions. And you can also imagine, you know, again, having two schools too far apart from that fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Um, so really, the two things that came out of it were, should the district really look at a K-4 Five, eight, nine, twelve models, which is up on your screen. So we overlaid it with the students that you currently have. Again, approximately 450 students per classroom at the elementary. Again, this is preserving special education classrooms uh, that um, Dr. Lons presented earlier to the committee as well as to the board. Um, you'd really need roughly 10 facilities, roughly 450 students. Right now, you have some elementary as high as 550, 575. So you're not maxing out the elementaries. Um, would this also cause maybe potential limitations for K-4, or I'm sorry, pre-K for four-year-olds? Um, yes, it would. Um, so the, the action of taking roughly 850 or 900 fifth graders up to that middle school does preserve your four middle schools. So you'd be a 10 elementary, four middle school, and then ultimately back to the three high schools. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities of this? Um, as you can imagine, you have significant redistricting at the elementary level. I'm going from 12 to 10. Um, the cohorts five through eights would pretty much stay level because um, that's your current configuration. Again, we did mention about preserving special education, music, and art. Um, in terms of closing the schools and repurposing them, so to give you an idea, most elementaries are roughly 50 to 60,000 square feet. This facility is roughly 52,200 square feet. We talked about Twin Sun and potentially consolidating and potentially I think you heard some like, let's really focus on ATP. You know, could that be a potential option through capital improvements? So again, that, you, know, you have two distinct facilities that you could actually consider for that repurposing. Um, lastly, we talked a little bit about the, the capital fund. So back in 2012, the district did do a, a facility audit and condition assessment with your architect and construction manager. There's roughly a $600 million capital need and the district's done a very good job. In 2013, coming out of the Great Recession, about a $67.5 million bond. Um, looking at millage rates in 2019, about 316. So there's obviously still a capital need that can be an assistance to help some of this reorganization go forward. So transitioning to the next option, which be maintaining your current K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12. Uh, again, that leaves roughly 5,500 students, about 465 per building. Again, still opportunities to preserve the special education, art, music, et cetera. 
um, you'd still have your 12 existing facilities at that standpoint, still allow for future growth. At the middle school level, uh, again, you'd be about 2,700 students. You'd need three facilities at roughly 900 per. Um, back in 26, actually all three of your middle schools were actually well over 1,000. So again, we know they, they fit from that perspective. And then more importantly, those three middle schools would feed directly into the high school. So kind of creating that alignment from K-5 into 6-8 and then ultimately to 9-12 going forward. Some of the challenges and opportunities, again, minimal redistricting uh, at the elementary level. Uh, the high school attendance patterns will stay generally the same. However, at the middle school level, you'd see a lot more movement from that uh, perspective going forward. That closed middle school, about 120, 130,000 square feet, depending on the school that's ultimately identified, um, could accommodate um, the ESC, potentially Twin Sun, and if so, uh, desired ATP, there is a primary or a secondary site going forward. And again, same consideration with the capital needs regardless of the facilities going forward. Um, with the ESC moving in these situations, um, obviously what would you do with this facility? So again, if you decide to sell it, that just reduces your capital need to maintain it. So again, that's part of that next steps of what to do with some of the facilities from a capital perspective as well. So we're gonna transition a little bit about capital improvement. Um, I don't expect you to read the eye chart on the right, but what it's really showing is over the last 25 years, uh, the pass rate for millage proposals, either for a zero mill or a uh, reduction is about 89%. Um, anytime you start asking for additional millage rate, that drops about 54%. Um, the bullets above, again, just kind of outline, you, know, you still have some needs going forward. Um, you look at some districts that have had a bond probably every five to seven years, that is best practice because we know your general fund is really focusing on programs and students and teachers. Um, if you're a corporation, you may have four to 6% of your general fund I'm really allocated capital, you may have less than 1% for that going forward, and that's not uncommon uh, in the K-12 market here in Michigan. So the last thing we talked about with the committee is really understanding what's the timing of this. So again, this is really just trying to align the facilities. Um, there's a lot of academic planning that still has to be taking place to make sure that Wall Lake continues with that strong programming. Are there areas to improve some of that programming, um, both at the elementary, middle school, and ultimately high school level? Um, Communication, I think you've, the district's done a phenomenal job. You've had public forums, you've had 50 plus person committees. I've had the privilege of presenting at multiple board meetings, you know, just keeping that communication going forward, no matter what uh, decision ultimately the board uh, takes place going forward. So all this information, we then uh, went back to the committee and we said, okay, um, the board's looking for some recommendations. Um, ultimately, these are recommendations for the board's consideration. Uh, so the first one is understanding the cohort. So on the top question was, would you want to realign it to a K-4, uh, a 5, 8, 9, 12, or maintain the K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12? You can see 75% of the respondents wanted you to maintain that K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12. So a lot of support uh, to maintain that going forward. The next one is, should we break up the band? Uh, as we affectionately called it, the committee is taking um, the Educational Services Center, and again, looking at potentially a high school, potentially a middle school. Um, again, how do you best service your clients, which are your students and parents and community members? Um, obviously, this facility would come offline, which we talked about reducing um, some of your square foot costs of operations and capital requirements. So 100% were um, to relocate ESC to an educational facility. Next one is Twin Sun. So again, about 12,000 square foot facility uh, near Loon Lake. Um, it's antiquated. It doesn't really serve the students that really properly the way it should be. So again, looking at elementary schools, um, other educational closed facilities, um, that was about a 98% uh, approval um, or support for that particular program getting relocated. The next one, we spent a lot of time really talking about ATP. So again, um, understanding which special education programs are at the elementary, how do they cohort into the middle school? I think you heard from some individuals tonight about you know, losing that identity if they're not really necessarily cohorting to a high school. Um, so again, depending on the cohorting, um, this was a question about really just making sure that they get the right facility. So is it investing additional dollars at Western? Is there two, two sites versus one? Um, so again, not a lot of, um, um, I'll call it disagreement, other than we want to help improve those experiences for those students. And we understand those students, uh, they do have a difficulty with change. So again, that kind of is going to come into play with the planning exercises of really how to provide the best facility. Next one is, should the district consider a capital project uh, to pay for necessary renovations versus a general fund? About a 94% pass rate. Again, this is without any timing or dollar amounts, but just simply recognizing the fact that 
You have a $600 million capital need, and as we know, the cost of materials and labor have gone up probably since 2012. Um, so at the end of the day, how do you best address those physical needs? But more importantly, as you're looking at reorganizing the district from a facility standpoint, is making those wise investments um, going forward. So about a 94% support of, of that consideration. And lastly is timing. Um, we have some districts that are at four or five, six percent fund balance. Their implementation period is literally four to six months. That would be rushing it. Um, as you see from the question here by the committee is, they want the board and the district to take the time. You know, take a look at the academic planning, look at the finances and the financial opportunities for potential capital improvements. So about a 67% said, really, you know, implement for the, for the 2025. So again, this facility here, if you were to relocate it, could probably move quicker than let's say, you know, going from four middle schools down to three. Um, so again, there is a timing consideration. So the committee's recommendation is please don't rush it uh, for 2024. So what does this all mean? And then uh, we'll open up for questions. Um, you know, people always ask, how do you identify which facility should it be? Um, this facility, as we mentioned, is kind of an easy one. It supports education, but it's not necessarily in the, in the general education facilities. Um, things such as age of facility, what is the capital need? What programs are currently there? So we know you do have capacity at the high schools. Again, looking at the middle schools, depending if you have three or four, how does that come into play? Most importantly is the academic uh, planning, which we talked about, really focusing on K through 12 uh, special education. We talked about specials uh, at the middle school. That was one of the things that right now, because you have the four middle schools, there's hard time actually having some of those electives really fully staffed so tra teachers are not traveling. Um, so it's really kind of limiting the student's experience. And then also at the high school level, just look at other programs. So potentially bringing back some CTE programs from um, the OTEC program through Oakland County, or perhaps there's new um, career paths that are out there that maybe they're not offered um, that you could do that. So um, that, that's really at the high school level. And so lastly, uh, the last three are really just operations facility. So um, I'm glad Ms. Wimmer is here to kind of help, um, you know, the rest of the administration team really look at this holistically. And then lastly, just from a communication standpoint, um, just be as transparent and I think you've done a great job allowing us the opportunity to work with this 50 plus uh, committee. So with that, I'll turn over to President Casagrande, Dr. Bernier and the board. Are there any questions or comments for our presenter? Mr. Siegler? Not necessarily for our presenter, but you know, again, I can't thank the parents and the faculty and staff that were involved with this. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we learned when we did redistricting and from past bond initiatives and uh, plans that, you know, sometimes it's much easier for the board when the community brings the recommendations to us. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example of that. Of, you know, we might have had our own thoughts of what we should do, but it's better to hear from people that are there and, and in it every day and let them come back to us to do it. So thank you to everybody who was involved with this. Mrs. Kaplan. So I do want to echo what he said. Uh, being on the other side, which I did for a long time, I did the redistricting, I did you know all that on the other side, and it is a lot of work for these community members and parents, and I truly appreciate them coming out and looking at this and coming up with some recommendations for us as a board to consider and look at, and that's a lot of work. So thank you all for all your time and efforts. So I would like to ask, would you go back to the slide where there's the uh, question of should we relocate ATP? So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, when I look at everything, I was taking notes here, looks like everything um, looked like it was pretty high percentage that yes, we should, we should do this. This is the one that's mixed. Correct. To Mr. Siegler's point, um, we look for information and, and look for that guidance from the community and from that committee because it's based um, it has a makeup of all the right stakeholders, we hope, right? Um, so this is where I'm not clear what the community wants. So Dr. Bernie, if I can ask you, our presenter here, what are the next steps to figure out how do we get that to be a little bit clearer? Yeah, so you know, when you're, when you're working with a committee, our committee was a cross section from the district. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you have folks that bring their own lens to the table and we asked everyone for their feedback and that with that said 
not everyone there is as familiar with the programming, right? Mm -hmm. So I have heard, you know, as was mentioned earlier tonight, I've met with parents from the ATP program. I can, I, we, have a, we have a meeting scheduled for January to continue the conversation and then another meeting scheduled for January. And I think that that is really where a lot of that is gonna take place because mm -hmm. I can tell you that on some of those questions, on some of the questions on, on the board right now, I have achieved complete and total clarity on where their where their viewpoint is mm -hmm. on on a couple of topics, and so we will continue to to work through that, and we'll continue to. But obviously, it also comes with uh, you know, Mr. Wills, and the the recommendation is pretty clear that it also has to come as part of a, a capital planning project that mm -hmm. we need to take on, and so I, I'm committed to continuing to work with them. But I think the best. I think the best way to go forward would be to continue to engage uh, with with the ATP families, not just not just the ATP families that are sending their kids to Western every day right now, but but also growing that conversation to say, you know, the the next generation of ATP students, you know, inc increasing their involvement and making sure that they have a seat at the table. Um, so I, I'm committed to continuing to work with them because I agree with you. I, I think, but I think the clarity is going to come from my engagement. Uh, with me and my team and the families from that program. Thank you. Mrs. Kaplan. Just a follow-up question on that. I know you've met with the ATP parents separately, but how many ATP parents were on this committee so that these answers, does that reflect any of you know, their opinions on that? Two? Two. Three. 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 Thank Three. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Next, we're going to move on to purchases. Uh, the purchase of new buses, bus award bid, Dr. Bernia. I'm going to go to Mr. Chatfield. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. Administration has obtained and analyzed bids through the Michigan School Business Officials Aggregate Bus Purchasing Program and recommends the award of 10 Thomas replacement buses to Hoekstra Transportation. Uh, this purchase would, uh, will be funded from the 2019 bond fund uh, in which uh, a dedicated source of funding was um, uh, scheduled in that bond originally. So we have two 77 uh, conventional buses at $139,872 a piece, uh, 853 passenger conventionals which are for special education purposes, at $131,862 a piece, an MSBO processing fee of $125 per bus for a total, uh, total purchase price of $1,335,890. Mrs. Kaplan. I move that the Board of Education authorize the purchase of 10 buses from Hoekstra Transportation in the amount of $1,335,890 from the 2019 bond fund. Any discussion? Oh, any discussion? Mr. Sapin. I know that um, Chatfield provided the board the information, but how many buses will we be retiring and what is the average age of those buses? buses? So we, ex we expect that the new buses would be delivered at the end of 24 or at the uh, early part of 25. Uh, we currently have 109 buses in the fleet. Um, we anticipate at this time we would be um, we would be disposing of 14 2013 and 2015 model buses. So we are basically where we were some years ago. Uh, whether that, if we were to take on that, then it would fall in that format. Uh, ideally, that is always the ideal a model is to have a 10-year replacement cycle. Mrs. Levin. Thank you. Um, a couple questions. Uh, I want to clarify what Mr. Siegler just said. Is it a state requirement that the buses can't be more than 10 or that's oh, no. just a good day? What's the state requirement? Uh, there are no state requirements. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we, we've heard from no less than roughly a dozen um, families recently about air conditioning at 
uh, in the northern gym. Uh, more than 15 families and then uh, students here tonight talking about the turf fields at um, the baseball and softball fields at Northern. I'm not saying that I don't support buses because we need to get the kids to the school to use those facilities, but I am wondering if there are higher priority items, capital items, that this money couldn't be spent on first before the buses or maybe eight buses instead of 10 buses so that maybe a couple hundred or a few hundred thousand dollars could be used to bring our facilities up to, to, to speed, um, specifically the, the baseball and softball fields. It doesn't sound like that'd be a huge expense, but certainly a safety concern. I understand that the air conditioning is on the schedule for Northern next summer, um, but you know, what does that mean for the students that will be using that gymnasium this coming fall? You know, when it's still summer here in Michigan. So, um, you know, I, I have some reservations just about if we have capital funding, we're asking for, potentially asking for more capital funding with all these Plant Moran slides. It's always asking for more, but what's the priority? And I think that's something that, that's been brought up a few different times with a few different buckets of spending. It's, it's not just spending, but what's the priority? And I think we have a responsibility as a board to you know, listen a little bit to the community. You know, we want to spend the money responsibly, but is it the right order? And if it's not going to be, you know, we take the bus money and put it towards something else. When and how will, for example, the baseball fields be addressed? If not, you know, moving some of this money around. Any other comments? Did you want to respond to that, Dr. Bernier? Uh, yeah, I was just going to point out, you know, that that this purchase is part of this completes the the process that the the previous administration and board had started to, to complete that. The air con the money for HVAC, uh, the bond money is there for that, and that work is slated to be done in the summer of 25, in large part because we, we could not take all three gyms offline in the same summer, and so that became problematic. We have the bids that are coming to you tonight, which includes HVAC work at Central and at Western, the design work for that began a year ago. So even if we wanted to say pull forward the HVAC work, you know, if you as a board said, forget it, you know, let the high school kids practice in the middle school gyms over the summer and do all three, there is not sufficient time for us to bring you bids and secure vendors and secure supplies to do that work at Northern at this at this juncture. Um, the baseball field issue is is one that uh, has come up and, and has come up quite considerably, but I would recommend the board allow us to study that a little bit um, to see if there are sinking fund implications or, or um, not implications, possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would encourage you to, to see about that because again, when you make a capital improvement to the baseball field at Northern, you're thereby obligated to make that same improvement at, at Central and at Western. So that's something that we have to review kind of that whole picture. And so I, I, would, um, I would ask the board for sufficient time for us to do that homework and bring you uh, a thoughtful proposal. We've, we've heard loud and clear and, and we've heard from the athletes and the coaches and I commend them for being so respectful in their communication, uh, but that is something that I, I think warrants further study at, at this time. So that those are my those are my thoughts on that. I would also like to to point out my understanding, um, Mr. Chatfield and Dr. Bernia, is that this purchase here is primarily special education busing, as special education buses go more miles. They need to be replaced more frequently. Uh, we need to keep those kids safe and in buses that are safe. Um, and I will say, very good record in, you know, with the inspections that you mentioned today, Mr. Tanfield, but I remember a time we had like nothing, right? And so, um, again, nothing against um, all of the, the great work our mechanics do, et cetera. Uh, but if we start to look at not replacing these, then in my opinion, you know, we, we start getting into situations where it's a cost benefit of where the heck do you want to spend the money? Do you want to spend it keeping up your buses that are older and you'll have those costs and then that will offset the newer buses as well. So um, I, I do support this. Um, 
Any other comments? All right. Oh, did you want to say something, Mrs. Fernandez? Yeah, I did. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, Mr. Chatfield, for bringing forward again the stats on the repairs because those were the ones that were in my mind from spring or whenever you last brought them. Um, what I, I'm trying to understand is, um, you know, we all want an updated fleet. That's important. But are, is there any immediate risk of being outdated or not having the buses we need for certain routes or for special ed purposes or regular bus purposes um, at this point in time if we don't pass this purchase award? Uh, I'd, I'd say at this point in time there's not, and, and that's simply because um, the board has, has supported a replacement schedule that's allowed us to keep, to keep a safe and well-maintained fleet in service. So it, it was not too long ago that we purchased four buses over the course of five years, and uh, we were in, uh, we were in uh, a real difficult position with our fleet. Um, since that time, uh, the, the community has supported bond issues uh, that have included the purchase of replacement buses. Uh, this particular bond uh, had $5.1 million uh, in it to, um, to purchase replacement buses for our fleet. Uh, this purchase would take that amount to uh, just slightly over $4 million and um, barring some unexpected uh, catastrophe that would complete our bus purchases for the 2019 bond. So, um, so no, there's nothing em imminent, but uh, two years down the road, uh, I wouldn't be able to say that. Understood. Thank you. The other thing that I'd like to just um, add that I think I heard tonight especially, I don't know that I have enough detail about it, but along with AC, which I understand the planning implications and the um, and the fields, which we've become aware of, and, and thank you for saying that you'll look into that. Uh, I think I heard tonight also that there's some critical needs in the ATP buildings and programs, and I'm certain that I don't have a great appreciation for what that is but in detail, but I feel like that needs to be a priority as well um, from a spending perspective. Any other comments? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. I don't know who opposed it. Mrs. Levin, Mr. Peterson, Mrs. Tice, and Mrs. Fernandez. Motion is not passed. Three, two, four. All right, bid awards. Dr. Burnham. We're gonna go back to Mr. Chaffin. Thank you, Dr. Burnham. Uh, we have two uh, bond bid packages for your consideration. The first is bid pack seven, uh, which represents the majority of the bond work for the renovations to Central High School and the Outdoor Education Center. There are 17 bid categories re representing site work, building envelope, interior renovations, and mechanical and electrical upgrades. The bid awards for uh, bid award recommendations for Central total six million four hundred eighty-one thousand nine hundred seven dollars, and for the Outdoor Center, those totals are one million one million nine hundred eighteen thousand and ninety-six dollars. Mr. Seifer. I move the board of education approve the bid award. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Dr. Bernie, back to you. Right back to Mr. Chaffin. The second bid package is for phase two remodeling work at Western High School. Uh, it also includes the pool mechanical upgrades at both Western and Central High School, which were bid together as a package. Uh, this package includes 42 bid categories. Uh, and involves the demolition of the A, B, and C wings at Western, along with a complete rebuild of the D and G wings, which are in the center of the building. Uh, it also includes replacement windows and blinds uh, in, the, in the adult transition uh, rooms. This work will start next spring, and renovations in the D and G wings will continue throughout the 24-25 school year. Uh, the, the uh, recommendations for Western total $24,407,278, and uh, 
and for the central pool work, they total four hundred seventy-four thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Mr. Schaefer, I move that the Board of Education approve the bid awards for the two thousand nineteen bond project, Western High School Phase Two Remodeling, and Central High School Pool Equipment from the two thousand nineteen bond fund. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Central High School flashing speed limit signs. Dr. Bernia. Mr. Chatfield. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. In an effort to improve traffic safety on Commerce and Oakley Park roads in front of Central High School, administration has worked with the Road Commission of Oakland County uh, and the Commerce Township Board of Trustees in support of the installation of new school speed limit signs with flashing signals to better control traffic at the beginning and the end of the school day. Uh, both entities have agreed to participate in a tri-party agreement with Wald Lake Schools in which uh, the approximately seven, approximate $73,000 cost of this project will be split equally. Uh, and, and you saw Supervisor Gray here tonight indicating Commerce Township support of that. Um, that, that frankly, is some, some tremendous progress um, in our uh, relationship building with Commerce Township. So administration recommends that the uh, Board of Education support this agreement and authorize the superintendent to execute all necessary documents. This is Levin. I can't read with my glasses on. I move that the Board of Education participate in a tri-party agreement with the Road Commission of Oakland County and the Commerce Township Board to install school speed limit signs with flashers around Central High School and further authorize the superintendent to execute all necessary documents. Any discussion? Just a question. Yes, Mrs. Levin. When are these uh, expected to be installed if it gets approved? Uh, the work is uh, expected to be started this summer, hopefully completed by the end of summer. Mrs. Fernandez. I think I don't see Superintendent Gray here anymore, but um, I, we didn't get a chance to respond and say thank you wholeheartedly for the support and thanks for helping to build that relationship to make that happen. Any other discussion? Project. Mr. Peterson. As you know, I've, uh, I drove in and out of Central for several years. <clears throat> I know the congestion is particularly in the morning. Uh, first question I have, is this both going to be on Commerce and South Commerce and Oakley Park, both sides? Uh, yeah, school? actually there will be three signals. One on, um, uh, one on Commerce Road, uh, west of the school before you get to the intersection. One on South Commerce, south of the school, and one on Oakley Park Road, east of the school. Okay. Um, I know we have a similar um, lighted system at Oakley Park Elementary also, correct? Yes. So the only thing I would suggest, and, and you know, I've been over there, I have watched Wolverine Lake Police Department uh, periodically citation drivers for not following those signs. Um, I sure hope that our local law enforcement would uh, would take some extra time to, because uh, signs or no signs, we had signs, even with the lights. I, I'm, I'm fine with this, with the lights. Um, I see what happened at Oakley Park to a degree, but I think it's still, Central's really challenging. Um, partly just by where the access is and uh, to uh, the student parking and that and uh, parent drop off. So it's a challenge either way i don't know if this is going to be a big fix it'll help a little bit more just to remind people again what they're supposed to do i hopefully law enforcement will will do and issue a few more citations too mr Seeper. i believe very early in mr chatfield's tenure with the district we were talking about getting any signs <coughs> at uh, central and you're you're right i mean we, we were we had instances many years ago where students would not use the crosswalks or not choose to use the crosswalks and we had incidents of students uh, being struck by cars. So do caution and I'm glad to see where we're going the next step. So thank you. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Authorization of restrictive covenant for community education property. Dr. Bernia. Once more, Mr. Chatfield. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. Uh, following extensive efforts to mitigate soil and groundwater contamination on the former community education property, 
a small section of the site still contains contamination in excess of State of Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy permissible concentrations for unrestricted use of the property. In order to establish permissible uses of the property, the school district must enter into a restrictive covenant to restrict uses only on the affected area of the property. Administration has reviewed the restrictive covenant with legal counsel and recommends its approval. Ms. Tice. Um, I move that the Board of Education approve the restrictive covenant for the former community ed property and authorize the superintendent to execute any and all necessary documents to effectuate the same. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. New course proposal adoption. Dr. Bernia. Mrs. Kohansky. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. Um, as the board may remember, the new course offering of ornithology uh, at Wald Lake Northern High School was presented at the November 2nd, 2023 board meeting uh, by Mr. Scott Terry, one of our uh, fantastic science teachers at Wald Lake Northern. And the new course offering for the program of studies has been endorsed by administration and is being presented to the board for the approval of its adoption tonight. Mrs. Levin. I move that the Board of Education approve the adoption of the new course entitled Ornithology or Bird Watching at Wild Lake Northern High School. So forward. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Resolution Section 105, Limited Schools of Choice. Dr. Bernia. For many years, Wall Lake's Consolidated Schools has been open to Section 105, Schools of Choice, under the State School Aid Act. Under this section, a pupil may enroll from one Oakland County School District to another. The administration is requesting that the Board of Education approve Wall Lake Consolidated Schools as a participant in Section 105, Limited Schools of Choice for the 24-25 school year with a designation of school openings not to exceed 5% of the most recent October count in any individual school, which continues your historic practice, and not to exceed 10% of the most recent October count for the 24-25 school year specific to kindergarten only, which is also something that we brought to you last winter and you approved. Mrs. Kaplan. I move that the Board of Education approve administration's recommendation that the district participate in section 105 limited schools of choice for the 24-25 school year and the school openings be designated by administration not to exceed 5% of the most recent October count in any individual school with the exception of increasing the kindergarten openings not to exceed 10% of the most recent October count in any individual school. Any discussion? Yes, Mrs. Levin. This just came to my mind. Dr. Bernia, is the definition of kindergarten kindergarten or junior kindergarten plus kindergarten? Uh, so this year, and I, I would defer to Ms. Kahansky, but I'm pretty sure she's going to agree. This year, our schools of choice was open to kindergarten, but we don't have any schools of choice students in junior kindergarten at this time because we placed all of our resident students in those spots and didn't have any open spaces. Is that um, accurate? Actually, Dr. Bernia, we did place several schools of choice okay. students. Um, and what we did, <laughs> thank you for that. that. that that's great. Um, uh, we opened it up to school of choice uh, siblings. So any of our current school of choice families that have students here, we wanted to be able to offer to those families the ability to be able to bring their junior kindergartners in. Um, so uh, we, we didn't necessarily prioritize based on resident versus non-resident or you know school of choice versus non-school of choice. We prioritize based on need, based on birth date. So remember that junior kindergarten program targets students that are quite young for kindergarten, that September 1st to December 1st uh, waiver window. So not that, uh, so in many states, September 1st tends to be a cutoff date for kindergarten, but in Michigan, uh, it's traditionally been December 1st. A number of years back, uh, the state recommended moving that um, back to September 1, kind of commensurate with other states, but then also offered a waiver to families. And so we know that um, kindergarten, and for many of our families of young children, that can become a, uh, a, a care issue, right? A cost issue. And we know that our youngest learners need that extra time. I'm kind of getting a little bit down a rabbit hole, and I don't mean to, but I wanted to just give some context to, to junior <coughs> kindergarten. So we went based on need. Um, and I believe we have three or four students that are siblings of our current school of choice families that do attend our junior kindergarten. 
Mrs. Fernandez? I have a follow-up question about that because somewhere in our policy committees we were dealing with the um, with the language around um, faculty and staff being able to send their students to uh, um, out of the district. And I thought that I understood at that point in time that pre-K are not able to bring their students into the district because you have to you have to belong in the district. Is that the case? So pre pre-K is different than junior kindergarten. So preschool is part of our early childhood programming from ages three to five, but junior kindergarten is for young fives. So those kiddos that don't turn five until that waiver window. Um, and so that junior kindergarten program actually, in terms of pupil accounting with the state, mm -hmm. is part of the body of kindergarten students. Okay. So that's counted in K-12 and not counted in pre-K. Okay, so, so pre-K different from different junior from kindergarten. That. Yeah. Thank you for that. You bet. Mrs. Question. Lovett? Just to get it out there publicly, when does the school of choice window open for Walt Lake? Uh, I believe, and, and I will answer on I'm behalf sorry of Dr. To ask without no, it's totally fine. I'll be uh, happy to answer on behalf of Dr. Lons. I know he does oversee our school of choice window. That usually uh, opens in January. I don't have the exact date in front of me. Maybe Mr. Durkin is uh, searching for that. And I do believe it's open for the month of January. So. Uh, Mid-January to mid-February, we just confirmed on our website. So, yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, board meeting date change. So in 2023-24, uh, our meeting dates were published, and we originally had intended that we were going to do our organizational meeting, our annual organizational meeting, um, on uh, January 11th. And there were a, a few conflicts and some concerns with um, personal work travel, et cetera. And we felt it was extremely important that we have all of our board members here if we could. Um, so we are bringing a motion uh, before the board to consider um, moving that organizational meeting date to January 4th. We would still hold the January 11th meeting as a regular meeting, but we would hold an additional meeting on the 4th. So I'm going to go ahead and read the motion. I move that the Board of Education hold the annual organizational meeting on January 4th, 2024. Any discussion? Mrs. Kaplan. So the organizational meeting, are we just doing organizational stuff and then we're saving the 11th meeting as our regular standard meeting? Yes. Yes. That's what this would mean. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Board policy adoption. Dr. Bernier. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. The updated board policies were provided for your review at the November 2nd, 2023 regular board meeting. The updated policies are in alignment with the current law, and I recommend their adoption uh, after a careful review with the board policy subcommittee. I'd like to compliment them on their hard work. Uh, we've had five meetings in two months, and so I, I really do appreciate their diligence, good questions, and hard work. I have a motion. Mrs. Kaplan. I move that the Board of Education adopt the updated board policies as presented. Any discussion? I think we went through the process um, just to confirm uh, before we vote. Um, you know, we bring a first, it comes to the policy committee, we bring a first reading, which we had last time. Comments were given from some board members that went back to the policy committee. Then they got revised again and came back to us. Um, so that's what we're voting on tonight. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And we are adjourned at 8.47. It just moved.